So uh, welcome to this panel discussion on the state of the workers' compensation system 50 years after the report of the National Commission on State Work Men's Compensation Laws. Uh, that's, that, in fact, was the title of that report. In 1970, Congress created the National Commission to undertake, quote, a comprehensive study and evaluation of state workers' compensation laws in order to determine uh, if the laws provide an adequate, prompt, and equitable system of compensation. The Commission made dozens of, of uh, reform recommendations in, in the report. So in this session, we will discuss how the system has evolved since the National Commission, to what extent the Commission's recommendations were met, and whether they are still relevant in our changing times. We have three distinguished panelists. You can read their full bios on the Whova app, so I'm only going to very briefly mention about them. Um, all the way at the end, we have Alan Pierce. He's a partner of Pierce, Pierce and Napolitano, representing injured and disabled workers. Right next to me, Bruce Wood has spent 27 years and has been retired from the American Insurance Association. He now has a firm called Work Comp Works. Um, most of the time at AIA, he headed the workers' compensation practice. And in the middle, David Langham is the deputy chief judge of the Florida Office of Judges of Compensation Claims. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us up on the stage. So this is going to be a slightly complex session. We're going to start with a brief video followed by remarks from, from each of the individuals to my left. Um, then I'm going to pose a few follow-up questions, and then we'll open up uh, the room to questions from all of you. So to start, we want to share a brief video interview with Professor John Burton. Uh, many of you probably know his name. John was the chair of the National Commission and is currently an emeritus professor of management and re labor relations at Rutgers University. John was interviewed by Jennifer Wolf and Alan Pierce about the National Commission. In the full interview, we have the privilege of hearing his insights about how the commission came to pass, how the commission panel worked to achieve consensus, and its impact on the workers' compensation system over the past half century. The entire video of the interview is about an hour long and is being made available to any interested party or group. So Alan, would, would folks reach out to you if they wanted to gain access to that? Yeah. So we're going to show about a five-minute clip of that interview where John comments on the current state of workers' compensation now as compared to 1972. So roll the video. Thanks, Kat. And John, you talk about the adequacy of, of wage replacement benefits. But I wondered, are there other areas of the system that you've learned about uh, you know, since the National Commission where you feel that there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of you know, coverage of perhaps occupational diseases and, and the compensability threshold? Sure. Well, I think all of those areas are ones of, that my perception of, of how the system is operating now is different than it was in 1972. For example, on the issue of compensability, uh, the National Commission actually put in as a report, one of, one of its essential recommendations is that there be full coverage of, of diseases. And in, in our report, we actually used a Department of Labor table that said 41 states already met that standard. Well, that turned out to be a grievous error. Is within a couple of years, Peter Barth in particular, but others, many others uh, along with him have looked at the system of, of compensating dis disabilities and realized that there's a vast gap between uh, coverage of people who actually have diseases and the ones who get in the workers' comp system. So that's one thing that I have really become much more negative, if you will, on how the system is operating. We didn't know it at the time, but in fact, diseases are one of the major problems coverage of diseases is one of the major problems. Um, as far as adequacy is concerned, I think the National Commission report did emphasize uh, several types of cash benefits, temporary total, permanent total death, that in fact, I think are in better shape now than they were before 1972. Uh, even though there's been some backsliding on those, the, most states still have maximum weekly benefits of 100% of the state's average weekly wage. At that time, they were probably knowing 
20 states at most, maybe 10 states that had a maximum that high. So the adequacy of those benefits has really declined. What has become more evident though in the last 30 years or so is as a result of two developments on permanent partial. The National Commission did not make recommendations on permanent partial disability benefits for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, two things happened. One is that the National Academy of Social Insurance about 20 years ago had a a study panel that um, in fact de defined adequate permanent partial disability benefits for the first time to fill in a gap for the National Commission report and said they should be replacing two thirds of lost wages. So this, we finally got a standard. And then secondly, there's been a major breakthrough in terms of methodology of assessing adequacy. The so-called wage loss reports, which are, uh, essentially are based on the samples of actual injured workers, tracking what happened to them in terms of their lost wages over time, and then comparing the, their actual lost wages with their actual benefits. And we've had these wage loss studies now done in at least 10 different states. Um, and they're showing that the replacement rate for permanent partial benefits is typically 20, 30, 40% of lost wages. So there's a horribly inadequate set of permanent partial systems in place out there. And that is that makes me think that even we didn't know it at the time, but it, there's still currently very inadequate cash benefits when you could take into account permanent partial disability. And then the other thing that's happened is that the commission put its emphasis on coverage of workers. Let's make sure everybody's covered by the law. We didn't pay much attention to compensability rules. And since 1990, that's the place, that's the direction that the reforms have, have taken place in most states, making it tougher for workers to qualify, even if they're working for a covered employer, what they have to show to get benefits uh, has become much more difficult. You know, an example uh, would be uh, some states have developed a rule, enacted a rule or adopted by court uh, decisions that uh, in order for the, the injury to be compensable, <laughs> the workplace has to be the major contributing factor. Well, historically, that was not the rule that was used in workers' compensation. It was a case that if, as long as the workplace was a serious or major factor, that didn't have to be the most important factor. As long as it was a, a non-trivial factor, the worker would- or an aggravation, the aggra so-called aggravation for pre-existing condition factor. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would say those are the things that have dominated the system since, uh, the last 50 years of things that have made it worse, as I said before, I think something's better, coverage, da, da, but compensability and adequacy of cash benefits, I think are still a serious problem in the program. And indeed, I would come to the conclusion that uh, the system today has inadequate benefits. It's, it's yeah. uh, the same conclusion that the National Commission reached in 72 is still applicable now. I haven't talked about equity, but equity, if you wouldn't have to get into that, I think the equity is not is probably no better and probably worse than it was uh, in '72 because of the, the way the states have reformed their permanent partial. In many cases, aggravates the equity problem. Alan, it must have been a it must have been a real treat to, for you and Jennifer to talk with John. Oh, it certainly was. Um, most of you, I think, know uh, who John Burton is. He has written so, such uh, an extensive body of work both before and after uh, the National Commission. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sort of curious how many people here actually knew about the existence of the National Commission. I find among a lot of my colleagues uh, that practice workers' comp, and that's what I do. I, I mean, you know, my 90% of my day is dealing with the individual injured man or woman and their families and less with the collection of data about their collective experiences. Uh, but before 1972, the state of workers' comp was so much worse than it is now. Um, and I can say that from some degree of personal uh, history, I started with Liberty Mutual and workers' comp claims in 1969. So I knew what the payment of claims entailed in 1969 and the early 70s while I went to law school and ended up working for Liberty in the legal department. And when the commission came out in 72 with what was about 84 recommendations, 19 of which were deemed essential, um, there was 
obviously stim stimulus from the federal government to try to cause the states to enforce as many of these recommendations as possible. And uh, I was interested to learn, I didn't know this, that before the National Commission convened, of those 19 recommendations, almost seven of them were already in place um, across the board. 6.9 uh, was the average among states that already met the, those recommendations. And since then, I think when, since they stopped studying it, I think it was up close to the 13%, 12.8% as of 2018, I believe. Um, so that's still, you know, the average state still falls short by one third of the essential recommendations. Uh, my view of what happened to workers' comp since falls into two categories. And if you hear the beginning of John's uh, um, interview with us, he uses the phrase um, adequacy versus affordability. And I think that kind of, those three words, pretty much summarizes the, the seesaw effect, the battle between competing forces uh, for change in workers' compensation benefits and benefit levels. You need to find a system that is adequate, or as the United States Supreme Court said in, in uh, 1917, when it passed on the constitutionality of workers' comp, that the benefits should not be unreasonable. It's funny they chose uh, uh, a double negative or a negative to do that. And that has really been the debate over the years. What is reasonable or adequate benefits, and what are the cost of those benefits, which obviously get passed on to the employer and get passed on to the consumer and the cost of goods and services. And these are very subjective balancing act um, <coughs> concepts. And since all of workers' comp change, except the change that may come from the courts and the, the appellate courts, but the change comes from state legislatures. And how do state legislatures pass laws either increasing or decreasing or changing workers' comp? They do so through the legislative process, which we are all somewhat familiar with, with influence by interested parties, lobbyists and interest groups. And uh, what we saw, at least what I saw, and I think the, the data backs this up, that following the report, the commission report in 1972, it took a few years. Uh, there were some incremental changes that took place in the mid-70s and the late 70s, but it was really right around the late 70s or early 80s that we entered the first period post-National Commission. Burton calls it the Reformation period. And that is the period where as these recommendations were enacted, as the maximum weekly benefit was targeted to the state average weekly wage as opposed to some other factor of two-thirds of state average weekly wage, where the weekly benefit was targeted to two-thirds of the injured workers average weekly wage, um, where there were um, increased medical benefits uh, under recommendations under the National Commission, um, and that there was an expansion of duration of benefits under temporary total and temporary partial disability, and um, obviously an addressing of permanent and total disability. Well, the one thing the Commission really failed to do, and I don't know that they could do, they really didn't put in place something on temporary partial disability. But in any event, the period of what, I, what Burton calls the Reformation period was really from the 80s to the beginning of the 90s. It was in the 50 years since. It, it's a relatively short period of, of time. And during that time, we did see benefits increase. We saw the availability of benefits increase. We saw coverage increase and the category of people that could effectuate uh, successful claims increase. And around that same time, we also found outside of the workers' comp world that medical costs started to go up medical costs within workers' comp and medical costs outside of workers' comp. And so the confluence of factors, I think, between increased availability of workers' comp, increased benefits, increased medical costs, led to a real spike in the affordability issue as the commission tried to address the adequacy issue. And, and, and the system became out of whack. The employers were paying much higher premiums. There were double-digit uh, rate increases going in every year. There are also talks about deregulation and open competition and state workers' comp regulation. These are things pretty much above my pay grade. But these things were also happening uh, at the same time. And when the legislatures were presented with the uh, specter of uh, employers threatening to leave the particular state they are in because of the high costs, you had the beginnings of what Burton calls the Counter-Reformation period, which began really in the late 80s, early 90s, in which I argue continues to today, that most, if not 
almost all of the changes legislatively to workers' compensation statutes from 1990 to today in terms of cash benefits, uh, in terms of duration of benefits and ap uh, uh, um, ability to obtain those benefits uh, have come at the expense of the injured worker. Let me just give you an example. I am from Massachusetts. I consider and I have always considered Massachusetts to be one of the leading states in workers' compensation for several reasons. Uh, one, I think it's in our makeup um, as a socially conscious uh, state. Uh, we were the, one of the first states to enact the workers' compensation law in 1911. Liberty Mutual was the first workers' compensation company. They are Boston-based. They are still a leading, if not the leading, workers' comp carrier. And I think Massachusetts has always considered itself to be in the forefront of, of workers' compensation. In 1990, when the legislature changed our workers' comp system in response to the spike in costs, they did so, I would say, with a red pen to the injured worker. Just for an example, the injured worker, average injured worker got two-thirds of his average weekly wage. That's pretty much standard around the country. Massachusetts, we reduced it from 66 and two-thirds percent to 60 percent. So that's a 10 percent reduction right off the board from every claim. Uh, secondly, uh, the duration for temporary total disability, TTD, was 260 weeks before 1991 five years. It got reduced to three years, 156 weeks. So that's a 40% reduction. Temporary partial disability, which is probably the biggest category of claimants, at least the ones that I see, are people that have a permanent disability, but it's not permanently totally disabling, but it does produce a t permanent partial disability. Uh, our benefit level was 600 weeks, which is just about 11 point years before 1991. It shrunk down to um, 260 weeks or five years or four years if you collected the full three years of temporary total, so a maximum of seven years of temporary disability benefits. These were tremendous hits to my clients. And as a result, uh, costs did go down quite substantially. Every year from probably 1994, 1995, took a couple of years obviously for these changes to, to kick in, but there have been single digit and double digit premium reductions each and every year since then with a couple of years where it might have gone up uh, by a percent or stayed flat for a, by a couple of percent. Has there been anything given back to the injured worker? Not really. Uh, we doubled our, our, our burial benefits from 4,000 to now it's indexed to the state average wage, it's around 9,000. That's been about it. The other major change, and John talked about it, was uh, the compensability. We went to a major cause standard. Now, keep in mind, workers' comp was designed to uh, take the place of the tort remedy, the civil remedy. That's what the injured worker gave up in exchange for this compensation of an adequate or not unreasonable amount. He or she gave up their constitutional right for trial by jury and redress for all of their economic losses or other result of a workplace injury. The standard was always the standard that if you got hurt at work and you aggravated a pre-existing condition, that was, the, that was to be borne by industry and not borne by the injured worker. Well, we have an aging workforce. We have increased technology of, of uh, um, imaging. And it's no secret that all of us that are probably over 35 or 40 have some degree of degenerative changes in our musculoskeletal system. We have arthritis. And if now a knee case or a back case superimposed on an underlying arthritic condition or some other medical condition that the person was able to live and work and function, now is not able to. We have an enhanced standard of proving that the work injury is and remains a major cause. And there is a lot of litigation. I would say needless litigation over what that is. And it goes back now into the arena of the competing doctors, the dueling doctors that for the insurer will say your, your client's problem is, is solely a result or is, is a ma the major cause is the underlying arthritic knee and not the industrial injury that caused him to have surgery and, and not be able to go back to work. So, you know, as a result, we have seen across the board what my colleagues call workers' compensation deform, not reform. And uh, I think one, one study I saw says that since 2003, 33 states have uh, reduced benefits. Um, now, on the flip side, um, you know, medical benefits have, have gotten better. It's not, um, it's not a, a good picture from where I sit. There are greater controls, at least in Massachusetts. We now have systems of utilization review and pre-approval and uh, 
a, a fee schedule that everybody at least seems to think is, is pretty low for Massachusetts, but an ability for the carrier and the, the, ins um, the uh, insurer and the medical provider to negotiate. Uh, but the, the major cause concept does influence the decision whether an insurer will pay for a medical, uh, uh, an MRI of the knee. The MRI shows there's, there's arthritis and the, the doctor wants to do some treatment for that. All of a sudden we're faced with, well, this belongs to health insurance or this belongs to Medicare. Um, so we have seen um, that there have been uh, decreases in benefits, decreases in the ability to obtain benefits. Fortunately, our weekly maximum is tied to the state average weekly wage. And our weekly maximum in Massachusetts has gone up substantially since 1972 and even since 1980 or 85 when we had um, uh, the indexing to the state average weekly wage. Right now, our state average wage in Massachusetts is just shy of $1,500 a week, which means a wage earner that makes over 23, I don't know, can't do the reverse math in my head, but makes you know high five figures or low six figures can max out at $1,479 as opposed to back in the old days was three or $400 a week, no matter how much your average wage was. So there have been some strides there. And um, you know, at this point, we still are faced with what my colleagues have called a race to the bottom. Uh, John's, John mentioned earlier in his video that his dissertation thesis uh, for his PhD was the interstate variabilities in, in workers' compensation costs. Now, that was probably 10 years before the National Commission, so that was probably in the early 60s. He could, somebody could write a dissertation. That's what we talk about at WCRI, is the interstate variability of costs. And what's happening, from my view, is this race to the bottom <clears throat> is you get this too? that once these legislatures see that perhaps in their state, their benefits are higher than the neighboring state, I think the tendency has been to lower those benefits to continue to compete, what Burton calls the specter of the vanishing employer. There is very little race to the top. And what are the reasons? Who are influencing the legislatures these days? It's certainly not organized labor to the extent they used to do. So many fewer, so many fewer, so fewer, much fewer employees are working under collective bargaining agreements that uh, I don't think the organized labor has as much clout in the state legislatures as they used to do. There are no real injured worker advocacy groups. There are groups like, you know, um, NELT and, you know, National Employ Employment Law Project. There's the different cautious. Uh, um, and, and the bar groups, the bar advocacy groups, such as Willie, of which I'm a member, where we try to influence the legislatures and legislators over the, what I feel are some of the inadequacies of workers' comp. Yet coming from the voice of the lawyer representing the injured worker is not always the most effective voice, because the first thing that comes up is my and my colleagues' own self-interest. And I like to think that we are advocating for our clients, and I know we're advocating for our clients in their self-interest. Um, but we are competing with large employers and large insurers and self-insurance groups and chambers of commerce and people that are looking at, they, I know that the employers out there want to treat their workers fairly and they want to provide adequate reasonable benefits. I realize these are all subjective terms. Uh, but from the clients sitting in my office, I feel right now the workers' comp system has been a victim of a race to the bottom, which is continuing and will continue to con uh, uh, go that way until such time as the scales are tipped to such a degree that a legislature can't help but to remedy that situation. We've seen it briefly in the early 2000s or into the 2000 teens where states that are seriously out of whack, it took state Supreme Courts to remedy that. I know, like David knows, in Florida, there were a spate of constitutional challenges to various provisions in the Florida Workers' Comp. It's just, not, it's just breaching the grand bargain. Uh, similar <coughs> battles have been fought in other states, in Oklahoma and in Kansas and Oregon. There have been numerous challenges to very um, reduced benefits that no longer were considered an adequate quid pro quo, what worker gave up in exchange for the, quote, adequate res uh, um, adequate benefit. So, at this point, I, uh, I feel the system is a whole lot better than it was in 1972. I think it still could use some adjustments. I think we really need to focus on temporary, I'm sorry, permanent partial disability. It's hard to capture. A lot of that is captured in lump sum settlements, and you have to parse out what portion of that settlement is for permanent partial. But the actual statutory durations of permanent partial disability, um, like I say, in Massachusetts, it's five years. 
and I have so many clients that are permanently partially disabled, and once those five years go by, uh, there is no compensation for that wage loss. So the costs are being shifted elsewhere to Medicare, to Social Security disability, to other forms, uh, or some of my clients, unfortunately, poverty. Thanks, Thank Alan. You. So, um, so Bruce, you've been an observer of the workers' compensation system over some decades now and been involved in uh, representing the insurance industry. Um, what would be your thoughts about how uh, we compare now versus 1972? Well, actually, part of what Alan said I agree with. <laughs> um, the system is better. Benefits are better. Medical treatment is far better. We've come a long way since the early 1970s. And by the way, uh, I really invite you, encourage you to look at all of the entire John Burton interview. I think it's an excellent interview. And aside from the substance of workers' comp he gets into, his whole history of how he got into workers' compensation in his life is absolutely fascinating. So I would encourage you to look at the whole, the whole interview. It very, very well done with, you know, with Jennifer. With Jennifer. Um, let's start at the beginning, 1972, the environment there. And uh, John Burton mentions in his, the full, the full interview, that conditions were much more positive then than they would be now, let's say, for a national commission. Uh, people got along better, there was more bipartisanship, and, and having worked on Capitol Hill a number of years ago, I could certainly agree with that. Uh, but there's another thing, and that is, and it gets to one point that Alan made, the National Commission, 19 essential recommendations, but states had adopted already like seven of them. And there was a, uh, a belief, uh, certainly, uh, even in, in the employer community, that benefits in the comp system needed to be improved quite a bit. They were inadequate. So in one sense, the commission came along and gave in its report an imprimatur, you know, to that, you know, to, to that reality. And as Alan says, benefits were very inadequate. And from an employer insurer's perspective, we would say, we would say the same thing. But the commissions, the commission essentially got mugged by reality, not once, but twice. The first was politically. Issued in 72, and one of the recommendations was states need to adopt these 19 essentials by 75 as if Congress can do anything fast. Or there should be federal standards. Well, there were only hearings. So you had you know, a thoroughly Democratic Congress, overwhelmingly so, in the wake of uh, certainly 1974. Uh, you had a Democratic president, and all you had happen were hearings on the Senate side, prompted by Senator Javits from New York, whose idea was the National Commission as a provision of the OSHA Act that was enacted in 1970. There was never a markup in committee. I don't know if there were hearings on the House side. The only ha this hearing on the House side occurred in 1980. And by that time, states had already improved their system, systems quite a bit. And the political landscape changed, certainly with the 1980 election, uh, and so it sort of ran out of steam. The other, so that's the political mugging. The, the economic financial mugging came some years later, beginning in the mid-late 80s, it's stretching into the early 90s, when uh, we encountered a national financial crisis in the workers' compensation system. And I arrived at AIA in early 1990 amidst this maelstrom. And I can tell you, it, it was chaos. I mean, every state was affected to some degree, some far worse than others. Residual markets exploded. Voluntary markets collapsed. And four states, Rhode Island, Maine, Louisiana, Texas, the voluntary market was maybe 10%. And you had in 1989 in Texas, the largest, uh, the residual market assessment in Texas uh, was so large that it drove the largest writer in Texas out of business, into insolvency. In 1989, the residual market charge in Texas alone was half a billion dollars. Um, and I could go on and on about all of this, but needless to say, the industry was facing 
an existential crisis in workers' compensation. And there were, you know, there were thoughts given, God, you know, do we even remain in this business? And so what you had here was the, to in part, the comp system, the recommendations, inflating costs, I mean, increasing costs, because there weren't the kind of financial controls that states could enact, would enact along with that. One major piece was, as Alan and John Burton himself admits, the absence of, of any permanent partial disability reforms. And so when we got into, I, I would call it the reform age, Alan calls it the anti-reform age, <laughs> beginning in the late 80s into the early, pretty much through the mid 90s, where, where states, state legislatures effectively com, uh, completing what the National Commission did, failed to do which was, in main part, deal with permanent partial disability. And, and uh, because there's never been any kind of real consensus on, on what kind of PPD system, uh, what we are really compensating. And so it's no surprise that the commission couldn't come to agreement on that. The commission came to agreement on what it could and didn't on what it couldn't. And PPD was the hardest nut to crack. But state legislatures, faced with a collapse of their systems, had to make a decision. And so they decided, and many of them decided, on an impairment-based approach. You could use AMA guides and adjust them and do various other things in, in order to, to, to corral the largest cost driver in any workers' compensation, PPD. And there were other changes they made, which you know, Alan and John disagree with, but the, there were policies behind these changes that made, that made sense, you know, um, major contributing cause. I think Oregon was the first state in 91, 90 or 90, maybe it was 89, to, to do this. The Oregon system was a mess. It was, for years, very high costs. That was one of the changes they made, and it made a dramatic impact. Now, one can say, well, that's, you know, that never been done before, and that's, and that's true. But the whole point of adopting major contributing cause, that kind of standard, was to, was to address conditions in which the nexus to the workplace was weak. And this was a disability system coming to grips with that reality. And again, wanting to be able to contain costs through, you know, through that mechanism. Uh, TTD, you know, the commission recommended that there be no limits on TTD until MMI, and conceptually that makes sense, except that there is often litigation with respect to termination of TTD, and, and that's a product of the legal environment in the state, it's a product of the, the, uh, the PPD system itself, which may drive excess medical as, as a claimant tries to, uh, you know, tries, to get a higher, you know, tries to get a higher rating. So in concept, it makes sense, but a lot of states adopt it a hard uh, duration limit on, on TTD. Not to say they're, it's eliminated disputes, but it's put like an outer, an outer barrier uh, uh, to it. So th those are the kinds of you know, changes that, some of the kinds of changes that were made because at the end of the day, despite, and I don't say this in a pejorative way, it, the commission's academic exercise, you still had to manage a disability program. You have to make it function. It has to be affordable to employers who pay 100% of the costs. And that is the difficult, those were the difficult decisions that legislators had to make. Alan mentions Massachusetts, and I remember it well. 1991, and Massachusetts was a mess. And the, uh, the reduction in the benefit to 60%, uh, well, that reduction in benefit to 60% came in the end, perhaps, grinding their teeth, organized labor in Massachusetts. And uh, that's a little fact that often is overlooked. So labor even had to make some very, very difficult uh, uh, decisions on behalf of the broader good for its workers in that, in, that era of, in that era of crisis. So I would say that you know, the National Commission did exemplary work in its day. And I think it, it's, a, it's a historic marker along the way of the long history of the workers' compensation program. Um, but I think it's important to recognize its limitations, what it knew at the time, how much more we know now about 
managing disability uh, effectively, uh, and, and you know, having gone through a, a, an existential crisis in the comp system that lasted the better part of probably eight or, eight or, you know, eight or nine years. So I'm maybe just, I'll just end right there and we can move on, okay? Sure, so, so Judge Langham, uh, what do you think about the National Commission on State Workmen's Compensation Laws and where we are now? Well, I've, I've probably got a different perspective than, than either of these gentlemen, but uh, I, don't, I don't have uh, some of the same affinity for the report as others. Uh, I think that they did do yeoman's work, but uh, I'm troubled by the fact that, uh, that they admit in their own words that uh, they saw themselves with a, a short window of time to work with, and instead of uh, taking a, a more deliberate approach on things, they essentially agreed with one another that the best thing they could do uh, was simply stay on deadline. Uh, I, I don't think that's a, a very academically honest approach to things. Uh, I'm troubled by the fact that uh, while they were given uh, license by Congress to address the problems in comp, uh, including but not limited to, and I quote, these 16 items, in the two years they had, they essentially addressed those 16 items, uh, limited to not by Congress, but by their desire to get a report out uh, in a timely fashion. As a result, from my perspective, uh, and that's somewhat academic, I think what the commission accomplished, what they were successful at, uh, was building a really fine foundation on a nice lot, and then they walked away from it expecting somebody to come behind them and start framing and building the house, <laughs> and nobody showed up. And so we sit here today looking back uh, 50 years ago, and we say, that's, that's a fine foundation. They, they kind of rushed to get that foundation done, but where's been the follow-up? Uh, where's been the conversation? And I don't think that it's out there. Uh, if anybody in this room knows of an endowed chair or an endowed professorship in workers' compensation in the United States, I'd love for you to put me in touch with that person. Uh, I'd like to know what university is studying this. Uh, I'd like to know what academic resources are being poured to folks. What is the social safety net of the American workplace? And, and I don't say the American worker, because that's the other, the other flaw that I find with this report. Uh, the commission in several places, with their language, indicates that they have an affinity for the American worker. Uh, my favorite quote is that the purpose of workers' compensation is the protection of the American worker. And while I'm not going to quibble with that being a purpose, I have real trouble with it being the purpose. The purpose of workers' compensation is to build a compromise that exists in a symbiosis between the employer and the employee. Because whether we like it or not, folks, <laughs> if there are no employers, there will be no employees. And on the flip side, if there's no employees, there will be no employers. There has to be a balance. And too often, what I see looking at these things across the country is instead of legislatures working to build balance, they all work in one direction for a while. Uh, they build a system that's either too costly or too ineffective. And then they wait five, six, seven years because none of them ever want to hear the words workers' compensation, okay? It, you can literally walk into a state house in any state you want to, and you can talk to them about any topic that you wish and get a smile, except workers' compensation. You say those two words, they're liable to throw you out, okay? And so they, they wait these periods of time, and the, the analogy that's been raised, and I love it, is it's a pendulum swinging back and forth. Well, that creates problems for both sides of the equation, folks. It puts employees where they have a lack of predictability, where they have a lack of protections, or it puts the employers and their carriers in a position where they have a lack of predictability and a lack of, of, of transparency. And as a result, we have the, the reactionism, okay? And that's gone on, I think, for the last 50 years. I expect it to continue. Now, what has improved? I think a lot of things have improved. Um, 38th annual? Isn't that what we're here for? 38. Yeah. So for the last 40 years, let's say, we've had uh, this, this effort uh, to put numbers to things and to provide some comparison among states. 
One of the main points of the National Commission was that if there was some standardization in our nomenclature and in our efforts, that states would be better positioned to be able to compare their actions and reactions to those of other jurisdictions. I think you've brought us some of that, okay? Have you brought us all the way home? I don't think so. Why? Well, because I think that you're A, outnumbered, B, overburdened, right? And C, just from my perspective, uh, I, I love when Bruce Hartwig gets up here, okay? Um, that guy needs to be on television. I would call it Bruce Hartwig the numbers guy because he does for economics what Bill Nye does for science. I can actually sit there. Uh, one of my favorite movie lines in the whole world is in uh, uh, Margin Call where the head of the investment firm says, explain this to me and speak as you would to a child or, or a golden retriever perhaps, okay? <laughs> because it ain't brains that got me here. I get it, okay? My point is this system, 50 of them, 60 of them, is among the most complex Gordian knot systems that I've ever run into in my life. There are more strings pulling in more directions than anything else I've ever seen. And I think as a, as a group of systems, I think as a country, we're devoting far too little academic and intellectual resource to figuring out things that would work. I think that we're on the right track with some of these things, but I think there's a whole lot of study that's necessary. So A, I think we should get back to studying these things from a perspective of balance and symbiosis. B, I think we should discourage state legislatures from playing this pendulum game back and forth and get into evaluating things on a shorter time frame and with more uh, micro corrections, if you will. And C, I think that we need to, as you put, recognize, I made myself a note. Uh, he thinks that he's perceived as the lawyer as having too much self-interest. I'm gonna make everybody mad, I'm sorry. Uh, I kind of get away with this stuff, okay? But at the end of the day, folks, the bottom line is, the only people that show up at the state legislatures when workers' comp's on the table, every one of them is wearing a hat and it's labeled self-interest. No injured workers show up. If the injured worker shows up, he or she is poo-pooed and listened to, but not really. If employers show up, I've seen the same thing. Unless they're a major employer, they're not going to be listened to. The representatives on this commission, right, that are employers, Georgia Pacific, and Ford Motor Company, N not a single small employer. Better than 50% of the people that work and live in this country work for small businesses. No representation in the academic analysis. No gig economy. Lots of issues I have, but that's my time. I appreciate your patience with it. Bruce, you yeah. want to make one quick remark, yeah. and then I'm going to go to Alan. For just, yeah, just one footnote on, on uh, what was just said. <clears throat> the point about WCRI or research, all that didn't exist back in 1972. Um, I mean, WCRI wasn't established to 84. CWCI was very young. It was established in 1969. Uh, NCCI, uh, of course, it was around since the deluge, but really <laughs> didn't do much research at all. It does far more today. What I'm saying is that we, this system, whatever flaws, Alan, you know, we could all agree with, and it's not a perfect system, is so much better off because we know so much more of what's happening out there. And, and uh, you know, when I was with you know, AIA, having a report from one of these organizations, if there was a problem with a particular state, to be able to go into that with the imprimatur of WCRI or CWCI, whatever, peer-reviewed research, and to be able to explain to legislators what the problem really was. We're not dealing with legislating by anecdote. We're dealing with peer-reviewed research. And I think that's put us in a far, far better place going forward than we otherwise would be. So that's my only comment. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate your support of, of our work.
And to... I, <laughs> but I can't afford to join. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so actually, one of the one of the comments that Judge Langham made, Alan, um, sort of resonated with me. And he talked about the, there was a foundation built, but nobody built the the building, which leads me to wonder about the the role of a federal government in building that building. What, what do you think of that? Well, that is that is the question. That was the question in 1970 and 71 when the commission was established is what role does the federal government have in overseeing and managing 50 different states and perhaps other systems that are in the, you know, outside of the state-based workers' comp system? Do you have total federal takeover? Uh, I don't think anybody want that or wants that. Um, you know, the, the issue now and the issue then is how, you know, what can the federal government do to ensure some degree of balance among and between the states? And I think as as uh, Judge Langham has said, there, it, sh it, should con it should be a continuing process, whether it's through the Department of Labor or somewhere, to continually study and advise the states or perhaps take some actions to require the states to do X, Y, or Z when things are totally out of whack. People have proposed a model or a minimum standards bill uh, where the federal government establishes some type of minimum standards for all of these, um, this menu of benefits. On the one hand, that sounds sort of attractive, that at least we have a, a floor. But my fear, seeing how the states compete amongst each other, is that this, this floor would be the reality, that there, uh, you know, we, perhaps we should have a maximum benefit standard, not a minimum benefit standard. What state legislature wants to increase their workers' comp costs and pay more than the minimum benefits that the federal government says is the minimum standard? So I'm not sure the answer lies there. Um, and Burton has some comments in the full interview of what he would suggest, but uh, at the end of Obama's term, the Secretary of Labor, uh, Perez, uh, issued, uh, I don't know if you call it a white paper or a, a communique of some sort, calling upon the, the, the workers' comp community and the federal government to really start and, and look at the inequities that this race to the bottom, this, and the race to the bottom doesn't so much impact my clients as much as, um, um, the, um, the difficulties in convincing a state legislature to, to, to do any changes. Uh, and the other point that he made was the cost shifting. As, as benefits go down, access to benefits go down, as medical uh, benefits are harder to get because of causation standards or because of utilization review or because of denials by, by insurers for uh, a treatment, the, sh the costs of that get shifted elsewhere. It either gets shifted to an, uh, the employee who goes without the treatment because there are no other sources of benefits. But we have a much wider safety, social safety net in 2022 than we had in 1972. We have Medicare covering injuries and, and health insurance and, and Medicaid. These are all systems that we pay for in another fashion, increased premiums or increased taxes. And um, I've seen some statistics that 21% of the financial loss that an injured worker and his family uh, um, suffer as a result of an on-job injury is covered under workers' comp. Um, it's a troubling statistic. The person that I see in my office each and every day is a man or a woman who got hurt at work and the impact on their family. I don't see pie charts, I don't see bar graphs, and I don't see comparisons between my client and his brother that might live in New Hampshire. I see the effects of my clients who have to make decisions about college for their kids or file for bankruptcy or lose their, their house. That's what I see. So I spotted some body language as uh, Alan was talking, so I was thinking, David, and then Bruce, maybe you could make some comments about that. I, I just want to throw out for, for everybody that's thinking the federal government is the answer, I would suggest to you that if the federal government is the answer, it's a really stupid question. Um, <laughs> I, you can go pull this. Uh, Pew has got a survey out there, not Mark Pew, uh, the research Pew has got a study out there uh, the American people had, had a confidence level over 70% in the federal government uh, during the Eisenhower administration. Honest to goodness, folks, it started down from there, and it hasn't been above 30% in, in the last 25 years. Uh, these, these, are the, these are the facts. We don't have faith in the federal government, and I don't think you turn something like this over to them and that you have any prayer that there's going to be improvement. Uh, the Model Act concept, uh, the Commission had a Model Act to work off of. It, it had a voluntary piece that had been put together by a, a business group, and it had a Department of Justice Model Act that had been put together. And here we are still with the foundation, John. 
Bruce? Well, where, where to begin? Um, I would just echo what uh, Judge Langham said about the role of the federal government. There, there is, with those who, like Allen and John Burton and others, who fundamentally disagree with the shift of the comp system, I would call it again the reform era in the 90s, that they remain unreconciled to those new balances that, that were struck. And they view this competition among the states as unhealthy. Well, states compete all the time on taxes and any number of other issues. Workers' compensation is an economic program. And yes, they compete on that. And that's a good thing. That, that is a hallmark of the federal system. 50 laboratories working, thousands of workers' compensation bills introduced every year. Thank God not many of them get through. But, that, but there, is a, there is a ferment out there. Let's talk about the ferment on the federal side. The federal workers' compensation programs, the Federal Employees Comp Act, Longshore, everyone here at Black Lung? Oh my God. I worked on Capitol Hill during some of those years. The last time FECA was, amend was amended was 1974. The last time Longshore was amended was 1984. The Soviet Union still existed. And of course, Black Lung is a multi-billion dollar disaster on an annual basis. There is not one, one remedy that the states came upon during the reform era, reform era that emanated from any recommendation of the federal government. And so, you know, but, but there is this desire to end this competition. We're gonna, we wanna, you know, come up with standards and have the federal government somehow supervise what the states are doing. That is at best a complete waste of time and at worst it would be corrosive. I have no doubt that if we had that kind of system when the financial crisis hit, we would never have gotten out of this mess. And we'd have a workers' compensation system today that looked like, let's take SSDI. There's a hallmark of efficiency. And one, one final comment, you know, Alan talks about cost shifting. And there was a lot of, cons lot of questions of, you know, cost shifting, to, you know, workers' comp benefits would run out and these workers would shift to SSDI. That has been debunked. You know, there have been, you know, certainly a study done, done by the National Bureau of Economic Research in 2010, which on point said that is absolutely incorrect. And, you know, the Social Security Administration did an analysis back probably about the same time about why there was a shift to, uh, to, uh, uh, to SSDI. They came up with, I don't know, 25 or 26 reasons why. Not one of them listed workers' compensation. So I would say respectfully, that's a canard. And finally, with respect to the race to the bottom, that's a pejorative. Look, we have been, uh, we've been in this race to the bottom for almost 30 years. You'd think we'd be there by now. Yes, states have made adjustments over the years. And in some cases, states have reduced benefits. But there has never been, and that's a minority, of distinct minority of states to begin with. And there has never been any kind of wholesale turning, turning back from what was the consensus in 1974. So I would uh, certainly disagree with this, this characterization that we are racing, and we're forever racing to the bottom, I guess, until we get a federal standard that raises all the, every, all the benefits up to an equal level. States are prohibited from, from making quick changes to their system in light of their own state economies. And therein lies the seeds for another financial crisis. Judge Langham, you made a, a comment about the representation on the commission, particularly about um, the lack of small business. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, if you were to build a, a, a national commission nowadays, would it look anything like what uh, we saw in 1972? I can say absolutely, unequivocally, no, it would not. Um, I've got a lot of issues with that commission. Um, I've, I've blogged about this. Uh, too many lawyers, uh, too many academics, uh, one woman. Are, are you kidding me? Honest to God, I'm not kidding, folks. Uh, there, there was no minority representation there. Uh, 
Uh, no small business representation there. Uh, no representation of the concept of, of opting out and not being about workers' comp. And I think there are businesses that, uh, that are doing very well uh, without being in the, in the comp system. Uh, this whole idea of let's get rid of the, the four or more employee idea. Okay, let's, let's make every individual out there buy workers' comp. So Mr. Pierce, as a practicing lawyer, instead of at a firm, he's just a lawyer with a, a secretary running a small office and we're gonna make him insure himself for workers' compensation. And I think we ought to let him be an adult and decide for himself whether he wants to be covered, okay? So I think the commission needs to include all those kinds of perspectives. The discussion needs to include their ideas and we need to consider how these things impact big business, small business, minorities. Uh, we've seen all kinds of evidence today about uh, the fact is, whether you like it or not, our, our bodies react differently. Uh, our economics uh, predisposes us to the way we, we react to disease. It's very possible it does for injury too. You know, why aren't we getting their perspectives as we talk about some grand plan? So that's, from my perspective, a, a major flaw in the process. Alan? I guess what I would finally want to leave with, at least for me, is to try to remember the name of this program is Workers' Compensation. This was the very first social legislative system of benefits. It is different historically and fundamentally from auto insurance and homeowners insurance and other types of insurance, long-term and short-term disability. If you look and study the history of workers' compensation, it did not begin in 1911. It did not begin in 1880 in, in Prussia. It did not begin with the privateers and the pirates in, in the 16th century. You could actually look back to whatever faith-based religion you have in your, your Bibles or tracts that the obligation of the work, the work, uh, the employer of a worker to provide for that worker when he or she is hurt or killed on the job is rooted in, in morality and, and that this is a the different system. This is for the injured worker. Now, that's very easy to say. The balance between what is and is not adequate or reasonable and how you do that is why we're all here. But my fear is, and in, 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 in listening to some of, uh, some of what Bruce had to say is, I think my clients are getting lost in all of this. I think the system is way too large and way too complicated. And it, perhaps it has to be, I don't know, there's billions and billions of dollars involved and there's the success and failure of businesses and the success and failure of family, economic and social units at stake. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think we get caught too much in the weeds of all of this. And you know, when you talk about the, the cost shifting as being somewhat of a myth, telephone call, Alan, my CVS won't fill my prescription, the adjuster denied it. What do I do? I said, well, I'll try to reach the adjuster. He says, I can, I can put it through my Blue Cross card. I have to pay a $5. Go ahead and do that. Hang up. Multiply that by a few million times a year in a few million law offices, not only about the prescription, but about the MRI that isn't being approved or the, or the surgery that it isn't being approved. Who's paying for it? It's being paid elsewhere. Now, if all of those costs that were shifted were borne by the employers and the workers' comp insurers, I suspect the cost would be even higher. But this is the reality. This is an imperfect system. We're trying to compensate injury with dollars. So you're starting right off with an unequal, you know, sort of measuring stick. But at the end of the day, this is about the worker and providing him or her a decent and not overly generous subsidy while they recover from work is really what the goal should be. And that is, I think, everybody here's goal. How we do it is the challenge, and that's why we're here. Well, actually, we are at time now. So I kind of think this was a very fitting way to end the, a very lively discussion. So um, thank you so much, the three of you. Thank you.